Hello, everyone. We are going to start uh, because I have a piece of paper here that says that we are supposed to start on time, and I think I'm already 30 seconds late. Um, thank you for coming to our session uh, about open source career path. Um, the, um, the idea for the panel was inspired by just how the economy looks like and how that has an impact on open source. There have been some big rounds of layoffs, uh, well, recently-ish and just over the course of the one past one or two years at least, uh, where we saw some bigger numbers and OS OSPOs being affected and, and so forth and so forth. So talking about how to secure a, a career path in open source, if that is something that, that you want to have, is something that is very timely currently. Um, on that note, before we go into all the introductions and then I will ask all kinds of clever questions and will inspire you hopefully to ask even more and better ones. Um, who is looking for a job currently in the room, if anyone? Okay, there are a few people who might be happy with, with one. Is there anyone who's looking to hire? Oh, okay. Last time it was better. <laughs> I think I think we had people on both sides. Um, but um, anyhow, we should then go into talk about how to get those jobs that you may or may not want. Hopefully you will be totally sure by the end of the session that you want them and how to get them uh, to some extent. So um, we will start with a, a short round of introductions just so that you know who we are and why we are up here talking about this topic. And then I mentioned before that we would love if you all would be involved in this session and ask us questions or um, give us comments and feedback about the things that we are saying. And uh, I need to fix up my laptop at one point to not go to sleep. Um, so, my name is Ildi Kovancha. I am Director of Community at the Open Infrastructure Foundation. I have been over 11 years of open source experience. I started my open source journey while I was still working for Ericsson. Uh, I worked on their cloud platform and that's where I got in touch with OpenStack which is an open source cloud platform and I that's where I learned what open source was and I also realized that I also really wanted to keep doing open source. Transitioned over the uh, the Open Infra Foundation and working with both organizations and individuals to um, let, the, let them and have them and help them in getting involved in open source and working communities. And whomever has the mic can go first. <laughs> Aha, I get to go first. I am Dawn Foster. I have been working in open source for, uh, I guess, many decades now. I, I started my career as a system administrator back in 1995, and I worked for a manufacturing company, and uh, turns out manufacturing companies hate to spend money on IT, so I used a whole bunch of open source software as a result of just being a system administrator. And then a few years later, I ended up at, at Intel, and they needed somebody to do some research and figure out which open source projects and Linux developer tools were likely to be strategic for them in the future. And they looked at me and I, I used to do Unix, which is, you know, practically Linux. And I knew what open source was, which at Intel was uh, more than what a lot of people knew back in 2000 or so. Uh, so I ended up spending a whole bunch of time looking at open source projects and I got more and more fascinated by the way they operated, the communities, the governance behind them. And I just found it really fascinating. And so I somehow managed to turn it into a career. I've spent many years doing various kind of community manager sort of roles at different companies, uh, Intel, Puppet. Um, most recently at VMware, I was doing open source community strategy. And now I actually, so I, I also, I took a little detour. I went back to school to get a PhD in 2015 to 2018 or so. And I studied the Linux kernel. And then I've, I've managed to more recently pivot that into a, a data science role with the Chaos Project, which is a community health analytics for open source software project. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Nitya Ruff, and uh, my open source career started back in 1998. I was at Silicon Graphics. Um, we were a proprietary server company uh, based on our own proprietary Unix called IREX. And, you know, the world was changing in those days. Uh, companies like Sun and SGI were beginning to ship 
uh, Linux-based servers. And so I was involved in the open source strategy around how do we move to a Linux-based uh, operating system for our servers. Uh, what do we need to, in those days, Linux was behind uh, IREX. And so we had to think about the differences, the gaps to enabling our customers. How do we you know, make that going forward? How do you support open source from a commercial company perspective? Uh, what's the business model, et cetera? So, uh, from that point on, just like Don was saying, I fell in love with open source because it's so multidimensional, and then went on to working at a small startup called Tripwire, which open sourced its Linux-based uh, uh, you know, version of Tripwire, and then worked at Wind River, uh, where I ran the product management team for uh, Wind River Linux, which is an embedded Linux distribution system, worked with the Yocto project, Worked with actually Dawn on Migo and Yocto and you know other embedded uh, Linux distributions. Then have been for the last ten years running open source program offices for companies like SanDisk and Comcast and now Amazon. And it it's really uh, helping companies navigate you know their open source strategy and contribution strategy. I also uh, sit on the board of the Linux Foundation. Uh, that's my community hat, and then uh, my corporate hat is at Amazon. I'm Allison Randall. Um, I also started my career in open source in the late 90s, uh, working at a web startup that was, at the time, one of Amazon's competitors, back when all Amazon sold was books, so you could have somebody who was a competitor. <laughs> um, I helped them with the migration from C to Perl of their CGI scripts, which, if you've ever written CGI scripts in C, you know that's a terrible idea. Uh, <laughs> but, so I kind of, from, you know, uh, using Perl at work, I went to teaching Perl at a local Linux user group, and then I started working on the design for the next version of the language, became project manager of that, and then president of the Perl Foundation. Um, and from there, I mean, I've had tech, sort of the technical track of being like technical architect of Ubuntu and a Debian developer, and you know, um, but also the track of once you're on one board, you start finding that you have skills that kind of transfer to other boards. So I've also served on the board of the Python Software Foundation, um, Open Source Initiative. Uh, I'm currently chair of the board of Software Freedom Conservancy and on the board of Open Infrastructure Foundation. Um, whereas in my technical role right now, um, I just finished a PhD at the University of Cambridge in hardware security. Uh, so I work at a research group connected with the University of Cambridge that developed something called the Cherry Architecture. So it's a secure hardware architecture. Helping them, they've been focused on BSD, so helping them figure out how to also support Linux. Um, I think, yeah, like for me, it's always been sort of this balance between the two, my technical interests and my sort of, uh, I would also almost say human interests, you know, the governance, the community building, that sort of thing. And I think they go hand in hand, like the technology wouldn't be nearly as interesting without the human side and the human side for me would not be enough to keep me engaged uh, if it wasn't also some of the most interesting cutting edge technology on the planet that we get to play with. And we have a lot more freedom to play with it than we do if you know it's just an employer telling you, you must do this and this. You can actually think, well, what would be the best thing? And not just for this one company, but for hundreds of companies. Um, so I think that's kind of what keeps it interesting for me. Thank you. Um, to be honest, I'm already kind of learning uh, just from the introductions of, of everyone. Like, it's never too late to, to learn something. If you want a PhD, go ahead and do it whenever it feels like the right time for you. It's never too late. Um, and with just hearing all the diverse backgrounds and, and the various ways to approach open source, I would like to ask the panel, what advice do you have for people, like the few people in the audience who are looking for jobs? Like think about interview tips or, or what kind of strategy should go into finding a job and not just a job, but some job that has something, some relation to open source. You know, um, I think Linus gave some good advice this morning um, talking about sometimes it's hard to work in a very niche project, which uh, maybe no one else cares about. 
Um, it's, it's easier if you're working in a project that uh, either companies adopt or organizations adopt or there's a lot of interest in because then there are a lot of jobs around those projects. I'll be honest with you, companies hire based on the projects that they're dependent upon. So if it is a hobby project, they may hire you for your open source skills, but may not hire you from a technical uh, perspective. So it's important to kind of say, what are the most important projects that are being used by organizations and companies and, uh, and starting to develop you know, a, a reputation and trust and uh, skill in, in that area. And I would say be much more broad in your outlook. Uh, as, as we have indicated, uh, there are foundation roles. You can join foundations. There are uh, university roles. University and the government are adopting open source more and more, uh, not just companies. And I would say uh, make sure to uh, be present on LinkedIn and you know, X platform talking about your open source work so that people recognize you, know, you as an open source person. Yeah, one of, one of the interesting things about open source projects is it really is, they're, they're just great ways to meet people who work for lots of different companies. So, you know, during the keynote this morning, one of the things that Linus mentioned is that, you know, you can work on some project that's your passion project, but if nobody else cares about it, it's hard to make something that's successful. And so I would say if you're, if you're looking for a, a job in open source, I would look at where the companies are. So if you look, for example, CNCF projects, there are loads of companies who are, their employees are contributing to these CNCF projects. And if you can contribute to some of those projects and get to know some of those people, you're not just making really good connections that could land you jobs, but you also learn like what companies you might not want to work for because you hear people complaining about the company that they work for or you hear people talking about how much they love the company that they work for. And so you can get a really good feel for which companies might be a good fit for you as well as making connections to the people who actually work in those jobs. And then the other piece of advice that I would give is job descriptions are not lists of requirements. They are nice to haves. So if you see a job description, I don't think, so I've had lots of different jobs in my career. I've never met every single requirement in the job description. Um, it's just most of them are looking for unicorns, their wish lists. If you know enough that you can probably be successful in the job, then it's it's likely that they might might hire you for it. So So don't weed yourself, don't like scan yourself out just because you don't meet every single thing that the job description says. I think in the current economic climate, which is loads of layoffs and hardware and software, um, not just open source, but across the board, and hiring is tight, my biggest piece of advice is don't be too close-minded about what an open source job means. You know, an open source job may be a job where you help a company deploy a piece of software that you're interested in anyway, or you help them figure out how to submit patches to the software that they're using anyway. Or honestly, it's just a job that pays you money that gives you the capacity to keep working on the software that you want to work on. Um, and they don't, like, they don't object to you working on it on open source. Because the thing to keep in mind is the economy swings up and down. So it may be a down economy right now, jobs may be tough right now, but what you do with your time at work and outside of work, now, between now and the next boom, can radically change what you're doing in the next boom. Uh, because when you build the experience and you become an expert in, in a skill set, even if they're not hiring right now, but it is a desirable skill set, then that could mean in the next boom, then you do get to work on open source software full time, or you do get that very senior technical position instead of the junior one you're in right now. Um, so it's basically just sort of broaden your horizons a bit. So what I'm hearing is that if someone wants a job that has relations to open source, then they need to be active, they need to be visible. 
um, they need to go and uh, make new connections, meet new people, and listen to what they say about not just the open source project specifically, but maybe about the place where they work and contribute on behalf of. Um, I know I'm an introvert, and I think a few of us on this panel are introverts, so it, the part of going out and making a lot of new friends, it's not always easy, but I can definitely say from personal experience that it really does pay off, and not just because of the open source friendships, but um, like connections are really important to have even in, in open source, or even more in open source, and also be open-minded in terms of how you're building up and, and growing your career, and don't necessarily be super focused on one particular thing that you think you want today, but maybe it's not something that you will want tomorrow. Before jumping to the next question, since uh, we are currently in the Europe region, I wanted to also ask the panel if like all the tips that you gave um, does that have um, any impact on, uh, no, does the geographical region has any impact on the tips that you gave or, or is there anything that, that is different in geographic regions when it comes to job search? I think there are definite differences. So you can tell by the accent, I am indeed American. Um, I, I live in the UK. And one of the things that living in a country with, uh, with good healthcare that isn't tied to my employer is that one of the paths that's a lot more open for, for those of us who live in European countries is um, consulting. So, so I'm now kind of a full-time consultant. My, most of my work is for the chaos project, but um, that path in particular is a lot more available for, I think those of us who, who live in Europe than people who live in America, for instance, where uh, if they leave their job, they lose their healthcare. Uh, which is never never a great situation. So that's that's what I see is kind of the one of the biggest differences in the job markets. Sorry, the the only I I don't live in Europe, but um, it occurs to me that the EU is investing a lot of time and money into open source, and you know things like the German sovereign fund is investing in maintainers and in projects that matter to the government and infra critical infrastructure. So following that and understanding the opportunities in government and in public sector investment uh, may be a good thing to do, especially from an EU perspective. I was just going to observe that uh, one of the things that we've noticed before, we've done this panel before at other conferences, is time zones actually matter a lot when you talk about open source collaboration. Uh, a lot of, if you're, you're based in Europe, uh, I used to live in the UK, I don't anymore, but if you're based in Europe, you will find that most of your open source meetings are at night, um, which has a very different impact. In the US, you very much need your employer's consent because you're doing these open source calls in the middle of the work day. Here, it's more you have to make sure you take care of your, your work-life balance and like don't spend every night on phone calls for, for your open source projects. Um, so it's kind of a, it's a different uh, balance that you're dealing with here. Okay, in the interest of time, let's, let's move forward with the, with the questions. So now let's imagine that the person got the job. So how, what advice do you have for people to sustain and grow an open source career over time? So from a company perspective, I would say it's really important to understand the role open source plays in your company. You know, why does your company use open source? What are the key projects it depends upon? How does it view open source? What are the policies in the company? Is there an open source program office? because you want to make sure that you're in line with how your company uses open source. You want to balance you know, what you do in open source with your company's uh, per business objectives on open source. Let's face it, practically speaking, your paycheck is coming from your company and you want to make sure that your company is successful in open source while at the same time making sure open source is successful. It's not one or the other, it's both. I would also, um, very clearly explain um, you know, to your manager that you, your requirements, right? That, uh, that you need some time to contribute to open source or how should you approach it? 
understand the policies around how you make contribution, how you participate in open source in your company, and adhere to those policies. Uh, because at the end of the day, you want to be successful, and you don't want to uh, get some of these things in the way. I would say if you, know, if you want to have a career in open source over the long term, one of the most important skills you can develop is being able to describe the work that you do in terms that your company actually cares about. So building on, on what Nithya said, because I have seen, I have seen so many um, people who work in open source who, when their manager asks them why they're doing this, it's like, oh, it's the right thing to do. It's, you know, it's good for the community, which is true. But it sounds, in their mind, they're going, that sounds like charity. That doesn't sound like something I should pay someone to do. Um, so you really do need to learn about why your company cares about the technologies that you're working on and how it fits into their broader strategy. Now, I, I know for some people that sounds dreadfully boring. Um, but the next time your manager comes to you, you can say, I work on Kubernetes because we're, you know, we're moving into the cloud native technologies and this is based, you know, and so you can build a story around why it is that you're working on this particular technology and why that work is so important to your company. So that's a skill I would say is, is worth developing. Another important thing is to embrace lifelong learning actively. Uh, because you will find that the things that seem super interesting or challenging today, both technical and leadership, in five years they'll seem easy and in ten years they'll seem boring. Uh, so there are some people who stay working on the same open source project for 30 years. They exist. <laughs> but those are actually rare. Uh, so always Embrace your own curiosity and don't feel like the thing you're doing right now is the thing you will do forever. Like, sort of push the boundaries, push the envelope of what you might be capable of. And if you try one path and it doesn't actually interest you, that's fine. Like, you know, but constantly push those edges and then find where you can grow because that is how you will grow your career uh, by following those elements of curiosity and following the challenges. So what I'm, what I'm hearing is that when someone has a job that connects to open source, maybe that's what they were even hired for specifically, it is still important to make sure that their work and how they communicate about their work at the company does connect to what the company does, what their uh, core business is, and what their goals and, and strategies are. And the other, and the other one is... Uh, coming back to learning that I think we highlighted already uh, in this panel earlier that you you should keep your curiosity and keep learning and whether or not you get a PhD out of it that's <laughs> that's a secondary question so um, going a little bit forward maybe around the path of learning so um, let's imagine that the person got the job but it's not not the open source job it's in fact, have nothing to do with, with open source. So um, if we stick with the uh, career path um, topic area, um, is open source something that, that people can or should get into for self-growth, something as kind of a proactive way of learning and maybe getting that job one day? How should people approach this? There have been many times in my career where, for a practical reason perspective, I, I needed to earn a living. And there wasn't an open source job available. So I did take a proprietary job. Um, but I uh, kept my open source connections alive, um, attended conferences, or I'm not a developer anymore. But as a developer, you could continue to contribute to projects that you feel are important, are you know, rising, are aligned with you know, how the industry is trending, that then keeps your open source uh, career alive while you're practically making a living. And, and, and then you know, in, even inside a company, you can very curiously go talk to your OSPO or talk to someone who's doing open source in your company, be friends with them, and see if there are opportunities to join that team. So there are uh, ways to uh, navigate that. And I do think it's a really it's a really useful way of learning new skills. You know, I don't know about you, but if I if I want to learn something new, just 
reading a book or doing some tutorials and, and trying to learn it without having some kind of purpose behind it is really hard for me. But working on an open source project gives you that, that purpose, right? And so a lot of people, so if you look at Kubernetes, for example, a lot of people get involved in Kubernetes because they want to learn Go because it's, you know, hot new programming language and, um, you know, interesting project. And so it's, you know, it, you can look at open source projects as ways to learn new technologies or learn new skills or get involved in just something that you find interesting. Okay, um, we have roughly 14, 15, 14 minutes left. Um, does anyone in the audience have a question or would like to reflect to? We only have one microphone. Thanks, uh, Karla Nieminen is the name, but the uh, question is um, if you have some uh, tips like how to showcase your uh, knowledge, like for example certain certifications or courses or how to show your like best structure, your GitHub profile or how to best structure your project experience. Of course it depends a lot like what kind of specific knowledge you have, but any, any tips on that topic is interesting to hear. Thanks. I mean, there's, there's a lot of answers to that. Uh, one of them is treat your open source experience the same way you would your educational experience. So don't just list things you worked on under your jobs, but actually list all the open source projects you've worked on, list the open source positions you've held, maybe separate. So maybe not like in the same stream, but like education you list separate, like just list your projects separate. Uh, another is give talks at conferences. Um, like that's one way that you really get attention for the work that you've done. Um, these days, write blog posts uh, about, and it can just be, this is something I'm exploring. You'll see a lot of people out there doing it. It's just like, oh, this is my experience using this command line utility to solve this problem today. And it's like, it's not complicated, but it just means they have a visible track record of their interests and the work that they're doing. Um, yeah, GitHub can be useful, but also it's often hard to tell. Like if you just forked a bunch of projects to submit one patch, it's kind of hard to tell how much you did. So that in itself may not be enough. You kind of need to provide some context. And that's why the, the resume can be helpful because you like, or CV can be helpful because you can provide some context around what you were doing instead of just, here's my GitHub profile. Yeah, so plus one to everything Allison said. One thing I do on my website is I have a speaking page which has all of the talks that I've given over the past, I don't know, more than a decade or so. And so, so that's a good way for people to see the things that, that you're working on. Or that could be a list of blog posts or podcasts or whatever, whatever your thing is. But have a place where people can go to find that. The only other thing I'd add is I'm seeing a lot of people post on LinkedIn when they uh, uh, have new certifications that they've earned or new skills that they have acquired. And I think LinkedIn makes it easy also to kind of make that statement. Uh, I think that's a good thing. And, and then follow and be part of projects and communities, you know, either on the uh, mailing list or on LinkedIn or X, uh, so that you can contribute to that project and help people in that project. Sometimes you'll be surprised at things that you know that others may benefit from. Um, and so it's important to share your knowledge. Yeah. Hello, I'm Rishikesh. Uh, so I've contributed to a few open source projects uh, via the Linux Foundation mentorship. The problem, like what I have seen is during this mentorship phase, we have like three months of time where we have uh, time to design, think about a software and then develop on top of it. But now I'm a working professional and it's pretty difficult to contribute to open source project given the rate of development in open source is pretty fast and uh, to cope up with it after, uh, you know, working for a lot of time in an organization, like at a company, coming back home and doing 
uh, contributions again is pretty difficult. So how do uh, beginners like this address such issues and make an impact? One of the things that I've done in my career is I, I tend to alternate whether my paid job is technical or not. So if my paid job is very technical, then you will tend to find that my open source contributions are less technical. They're much more around maybe just being a person that helps new users get started and answers questions or community building or leadership or something that doesn't take so much dedicated attention. And that, that's a thing that I could, I could do on the side of, you know, if you're working at a startup and you're working like 70 hours a week, you, you really don't have time to do something on the side. And then I've also sometimes taken a paid job that was much lighter weight, like just organizing an open source conference. That was my paid job for a few years. Um, and that gave me so much time to do open source work on the side, uh, being a system administrator at a university. That was one of the earliest things I did while working almost full time on open source because they just paid me to kind of sit there and fix things when they broke. Um, so, you know, I would say both don't feel bad about taking a break from development for a while because actually in that job you are learning valuable development skills that will feed back into your open source expertise in the future. Um, but also, you know, you can still stay involved in the community even if you aren't contributing patches. I, I, you know, Alison said it so well, it's a portfolio approach, right? And you kind of create uh, a mix of um, your life experiences that balances out and works together. And also draw boundaries on your corporate job also. Uh, don't be burning out such that you have no time to live or to contribute or to do anything else, right? And, and you have to work smart, not hard. You don't need to do 70 hours. Um, and most people, and you can just do one hour a week, set aside one or two hours a week to do open source, whether it is just scouring the web or answering questions or whatever. Um, that one hour adds up over 52 weeks, and, and so you start building you know, that competency. Uh, the open source jester. <laughs> yeah, basically. The awesome jester. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Nita. Actually, it's it's more like an emphasis on what has been already covered. And from my personal experience, I can only say don't focus too much on the code. Because as the more niche a project gets, the more enthusiastic and talented coders are there already. What they are all struggling with is like somebody who is just hand-holding newbies or writes stuff on LinkedIn or just if if you look at me personally who grabs a laptop at the terminal and just does random things in order to help others um, not going into details too much one of so, such uh, niche projects I'm very active with I have basically worked all my way from a total newbie to the let's say core people there and I have, uh, don't have a single line of code contributed there. Not even in, in the documentation. Zero, nada, not a single patch. And if, if, you're, uh, if you're in open source, that does not mean it's only about code. It is, is about you as a person. If you are enthusiastic, do what you feel is right and what might help your project. If it is one that helps your company, good. If it is one that is dear to your heart, also good. You, it, the choice is, is yours. Do, do that, what feels right, and somebody will acknowledge it, I would say. And one, one last word about niche projects. Yes, it's not as cool, but it's way easier there. Because if you're trying to break into Kubernetes, then you're competing with like a couple of 10,000. If you are trying to break into Yocto, then you're competing with nobody, essentially. <laughs> <laughs> and, and there's a lot of other projects like that. May I just grab the, phone, uh, the microphone and add to that? Um, I can just stress what, what the guy before me said. I'm in Linux and open source for almost 25 years now. I'm a Linux system administrator, 
with the same company for 23 years. And I can also stress what Allison said, because although I've been an admin for such a long time, my journey was going back and forth. And if you keep an op your eyes open and the heart open and are curious about things, my job has changed so much when I think back to the hardware that I had to take care of like 23 years ago and the, the stuff I'm doing now where it's basically all virtualization and stuff. And you learn so many things and the beauty about open source, um, especially in the last couple of years, it's open source is so many things. It's not only Linux, it's not only coding. Like the guy before me said, I have basically only written a few shell scripts and I don't really code, but I still consider myself a core Linux and open source person. And if you want to really start out, you can look out for projects on the net that need help with basic things like documentation or translation. So dip your toe into it and, and I'm sure also a good thing is if you have Linux users groups in your area, get to know the people because they usually have open source jobs and they can tell you about the companies that are in the area and, and you know, you grow your network and you grow uh, a circle of friends as well. Amazing, thank you. Do you all want to reflect to no, any of the points? <laughs> Um, since the room filled up before, uh, after we started, I just I will ask this, uh, repeat this question a little bit, and then I will give you the microphone. Is there anyone in the room who's currently hiring and looking for people to to work for your company? Oh, there's one person in the back. All right, <laughs> who's looking for a job? <laughs> there you go. Y'all should meet. <laughs> All right. Thank you. So I'm Marcel and um, I observe now open source also since some years. Um, I'm still missing a little bit of structure in a career, not on the horizontal, but on the vertical. And uh, that would be interesting, your opinion on that, because with a developer, you have a junior developer, senior developer, and you grow an architect, whatever. What would be the equivalent in your point of view as an open source whatever? So from uh, inside a company perspective, um, you know, a casual contributor to becoming um, a committer and maintainer, uh, and those are pretty good positions. And maintainers, for example, at Amazon are principal engineers and senior principal engineers. Um, that's a darn good position. And then um, we have people in the OSPO, Open Source Program Office, guiding other open source developers to contribute as well. So take your knowledge and scale it across the company, across the industry. So those are all pretty senior positions. Uh, clearly, as my colleagues have indicated, you can have increasing governance and leadership positions in foundations, sitting on boards or you know, being an executive director or a director as uh, Don is. Those are also, uh, you know, vertically leadership positions, I would say. Um, so those are a few ideas. Yeah, the thing I would add to that is I, I really recommend that people spend some hard time thinking about what they want to do because it's really easy to just get pushed up that ladder by your employers. And then pretty soon, you know, even in a lot of cases like principal engineers and senior principal engineers, they don't write much code. Um, maintainers don't even often write a lot of code. They spend a lot of time reviewing other people's contributions and merging those. And if what you really want to do is write a bunch of code, then maybe you don't want to go all the way, all the way up that ladder. So think about about what you really want to do and what you love and what your passion is, and then find roles that allow you to do that. And sometimes it's moving horizontally rather than moving moving up the up the ladder. The thing I comment that's different between companies and outside of companies is in companies you tend to have technical track or management track. Uh, some companies have technical track roles that are all the way up to the very top. I had a distinguished engineer position at HP that is it's equivalent to director of engineering. Actually, they gave me both hats for some reason, but they'd go all the way up to fellow. Uh, which is like senior VP kind of level. So they will have technical track. And 
but they don't tend to let you usually, I did do both at the same time, they don't tend to let you do both at the same time, whereas in, in open source, you can absolutely be on the board of directors of the foundation for the project and at the same time be contributing patches or be a maintainer or even a pro technical project leader as well. Um, so you tend to be able to embrace your interests a little bit more flexibly outside of companies than inside of companies. And inside of companies, it's often very hard to switch from one to the other. Whereas outside of companies, it's actually often very easy if you're just a technical project lead to go over to that board track because they really want people engaged in governance or the good foundations really want people engaged in governance who also understand the technology. Um, so it's really valuable to have people with development skills kind of crossing over back and forth uh, on those boundaries. And with that, we are unfortunately out of time. One thing that, that I, would, I would say um, before we depart from the session is that one of the advices that the panelists gave was to make new, new connections, meet new people, and, and talk to them. That can help you get into an open source project, that can help you land your new job. You saw in this room that there are people who are hiring, there are people who are looking for jobs. Um, so use the opportunity while you're here at the event to, to meet new people and if you have to force yourself a little bit, then it's worth it. I promise I, it's not something that I'm good at, but it is really, really worth it. And also please come up to us and, and talk to us after the session. We will be here or find us on various, I don't know, social media platforms, chat platforms, um, we, we do everything to be very visible, so find us and talk to us. And thank you for being here at our session. Thank you.